and hello and welcome to Breaking Bard Macbeth here on twitch.tv slash life action roleplay where we adapt Shakespeare plays to 2021 sensibilities with some of my director friends. And let me start off with introducing our director, Ashley. Say hi, Ashley. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here tonight, bringing you a damaged spot of Shakespeare. I am so excited for this. All right. Where? Give me a random interesting fact about yourself. We're going to have everyone do this. Okay, random interesting fact. Um, the two pets that I own are a white Italian cat named Killer and a dwarf reticulated python named Montague Dopamine Boop Noodle the Third. How very Shakespeare of you. You can't have a python and not name it Monty, right? Uh, right. <laughs> uh, next, we're going to go in order from what I can see here on Zoom. We're going to go to Derek. Say hi, Derek. Oh, Derek, on, you're on mute. Yay. I can do things. Uh, my name is Derek James. Uh, my interesting fact is uh, technology is new to me, uh, which I just demonstrated. Uh, I've been teaching and performing theater in uh, San Francisco for 20 years and uh, absolutely adore the chance to kind of uh, dust off Shakespeare and take him for a spin. All right. Thank you, Derek. Next, we have a very familiar face here on Life Action Roleplay. Shoshana. Say hi, Shoshana. Hi, Shoshana. <laughs> That's a live action role play tradition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shoshana. Um, I'm also incredibly excited uh, to be on this. And my fun fact is that uh, so I'm currently in a production of Titus Andronicus, a stage show. And the audition that I did was the scene that I worked with Ashley that I'll be performing for you in, in just a moment. And I'm pretty sure that's why I got the part. So shout out to Ashley and her awesome directing skills. What? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. That by itself validates this entire project. <laughs> like, thank you. I'm like, listen, I'm we're just doing Shakespeare for fun. Okay. The fact that someone actually landed a role in, in Meat Space is amazing so yay well done and i'm excited i'm so excited <laughs> next uh we have our friend darren say hi darren hi darren hi everybody what's up uh name an interesting fact about yourself i know no pressure fact. no no worries uh i love to travel i've lived abroad i've lived in germany and okinawa and uh i absolutely love seeing more and more of this great world of ours all right. Next, we go to a new face, Rachel. Say hi, Rachel. Hey, what's up, y'all? So tell us a interesting fact about yourself or a random one. Yeah, I was about to say that wasn't the prompt that you gave me before the call. So I had to come up with something on the spot. And the first thing that I thought of is for my friend Colleen's quarantine birthday. Shout out to Colleen. I decided that I was going to make a balloon arch and went down like this crazy rabbit hole on YouTube. Um, so my interesting fact is that I'm really good at balloon arches. And I also think that everybody should make a balloon arch because it was very gratifying. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rachel. Next, another familiar face here on Life Action Roleplay, Anthea. Say hi, Anthea. Hi, everyone. How y'all doing? I'm very excited. Um, my interesting fact is you've probably seen me here because I run a LARP and a LARP organization here in the Bay Area, and I do a lot of life, a life action role playing. So, <laughs> thank you, Anthea. And last but definitely not least, a piece that we haven't seen in life action role play uh, for a while, but uh, a familiar cast member from my time at Blank Slate over at Scabby Rooster. We have Case. Say hi, Case. Hi, Case. Uh, yeah, you may not have seen me for a while uh, on 
at least on live action roleplay. You have heard me on live action roleplay before, though, in the podcast. Mm -hmm. Been on a couple mm -hmm. of those. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to be back here and uh, be doing some Shakespeare with these wonderful people. All right. And oh, interesting fact about yourself. Uh, I, I I was born in a uh, country that no longer exists. Uh, uh, I was born on a military base in West Germany. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All of us are trying to do some like quick modern history. We're like, you're like, they're like, Luxembourg, hmm. <laughs> no, Yugoslavia. <laughs> if that, which is an actual possible thing, that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah. All right. Yeah. My, my birth certificate says West Germany. It's always very interesting when I have to apply for things. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, before we begin, uh, Ashley, would you like to say a few words about how you approached uh, Macbeth when dealing with this project online? Uh, oh, before we begin. So for this project, we usually adapt a few different scenes rather than the entire play because... Otherwise, the entire play will take forever. But we want to show that Shakespeare is accessible to the modern era by modernizing some of the language. And even Ashley has a different approach from how I did it with Romeo and Juliet. So if Ashley, if you can talk a little bit about your process in dealing with uh, Macbeth, uh, bringing it onto Zoom, and your adaptation. Absolutely. So as soon as Ryan started this project, I like immediately messaged him and said, have you thought about the Scottish play? Because I love the Scottish play. And so picking a couple of scenes from it seemed at first blush, like no big deal. I'll just pick a couple scenes. We'll move through this. And it became very apparent very quickly to me that Mackers is not actually like a scene dialogue based show. Um, and that picking scene work from Mackers was gonna be hard. Um, and that perhaps there was a reason why it's not the common scene work that's done. There are some dope monologues in it. There are some incredible like moments. It's a show that generally has a lot of great fight choreography and like special effects and your choice of how the witches are putting things in the cauldron and what your apparitions look like, you know, are, are huge pieces. And I realized that like, oh, I only have dialogue and this might not have been the easiest show to pick. But what I did was go through and pick um, two scenes that I love and then two monologues that I love. Uh, full confession, I played Witch 3 in a production that changed my life. Shout out to Steph Hankinson. Um, and I really knew that I wanted to do the cauldron scene because the ingredients of the witches are something that I feel are so often glossed over and I didn't want them glossy or forgotten. Uh, I also had a couple of extraordinary actors that I really wanted to see do uh, Lord M. So you'll see them do Lord M tonight. And so what we've done is select two scenes, a, the cauldron monologue and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, you'll also notice that I will not say the play's title. I always call it Mackers of the Scott. 100% that thespian. So even though we're on Zoom, uh, I'll even call Lord M, Lord M. Will you have an objection if I say the name? Not at all, though you should run around the theater three times and spit over your left shoulder. In this case, because I am broadcasting from my house, I will run around my house three times and then Perfect. spit in the toilet. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, if we don't have anything else, we can start um, with your first thing that you'd like to present. If you'd like to give us a little overview of what you're planning to do for the first scene. Absolutely. So the first scene that I picked is Act 1, Scene 7, 
uh, the scene that I referred to in kind of my notes as screw your courage to the sticking place. Um, I picked this scene because I am a firm believer that the Scottish play should be a true like love between Lord and Lady M and not just kind of like a manipulator relationship or one person leading the other. And this is one of the most kind of intimate scenes you get between them. It is them talking. And so what has happened previously is just the slight lead up to this. Lord M has just distinguished himself in the war. He comes across some weird sisters with one of his besties, is told that he's going to get an extra Thane title um, as well as the kingship. And it's like, whoa, that's ridiculous. And then is told, oh, you have a, a new title. And so he sends a letter back to his lady love who immediately is like, oh, you're gonna be king, babe? Excellent, I will enable you. And so they decide to kill the king. And then Lord M begins to have um, second thoughts. And that is where act one, scene seven picks up. All right, I will go ahead and turn off my camera. If we're done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught, return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then, as his host, who should against the murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculty so meek hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongue against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast of heaven's cherubim, forced upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. Come now, what news? He hath almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? Know you not he has? We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late. And I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk? Wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love, art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteem the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would like the poor cat in the adage? Oh, pretty peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is not. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both they have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you? I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked the nipple from his boneless gums and dashed his brains out, had I so sworn as you had done. 
If we should fail. We fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. <sighs> when Duncan is asleep, or to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume and the receipt of reason a limb back only. Mm -hmm. When in swinish sleep their drenched natures lie as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Oh. Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. <laughs> Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have got? Who dares receive it other when we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death? I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away, and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. I was told I wasn't supposed to clap because it doesn't go well, so I'm giving the round you, of applause. You, you can clap. You can totally clap. Oh. I just love those two. Um, it was such a joy to get to direct these two through this scene because I just loved how this kind of chemistry and love story unfolds, right? Um, and so we, when we went to translate this scene, the thought was what is the equivalence of having the king for dinner and planning to kill him? right? Like a liege lord, what is the equivalent in today's society? Um, and so ultimately what we kind of chose was to take it boardroom. Uh, and so it was a, a fun kind of how to keep it modern, but keep that ranked system. And so that's kind of what we uh, leaned into for the translation. And what was really interesting was that my drive to make Lord and Lady M love each other so much was like an unknown hot take. I, uh, Darren and Shoshana were like, oh, I've never seen that line as a come on before, Ashley. But like, OK, if that's how you want us to do it, you know, and I think it just turned out great. So here is the um, modern take. All right, the modern take adapted by Ashley Barton. If I'm going to do it when I can do it, I might as well get it done. If I can pull this off and end up next in line, this single act could be a one and done tonight. But tonight, at this juncture, our future is in my hands. And there's a lot to consider. We might just be bloodying our hands to get caught red-handed. Karma's a bitch. And I have fiduciary duties. First, I'm a shareholder and an employee, both strong arguments against. And as his host, I should look out for his interests rather than sabotage them myself. Besides, Duncan is a great boss. He has been incredibly generous with benefits, and his followers would just make the hashtag trend for days, hashtag justice for Duncan. And celebrities with their thoughts and prayers riding the trend on Instagram, a blackout day, doom scrolling through endless nothing. I have no motivation to do this. Only the allure of a corner office and thankless overtime. Oh, hey, what's up? He's almost done with dinner. Why aren't you back inside? Is he asking for me? Of course he is. <laughs> We're calling it off. 
he just promoted me. I'm kind of a big deal now, and I deserve this. Okay, were you just high earlier? Now you're coming down and you can't keep it up? All right, good to know you can't rise to the occasion when you have the opportunity. You're not gonna seize the moment when you have the chance. Not so young, scrappy, and hungry, just throwing away your shot. Babe, 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 I'm playing this like a boss. I'm not making any rookie mistakes here. Okay, then what up and comer was it that workshopped this with me? When you follow through, then you're the boss. And by taking what you deserve, then you will actually be the boss. Oh, we couldn't have planned this better if we tried. Everything fell into place. And now that's what's tripping you up? I've been a mom. I know what it's like to hold my baby in my arms. And if I promised like you had promised I would while it cooed up in my face, have thrown it to the ground and curb stomped him. But what if we fuck up? Fuck up? Don't be a fuck up and we won't fuck up. When Duncan is sleeping, and after the day of travel he's had, there's no way that he will not be out cold, I will take a nice little bottle of something to his bodyguards and get them so wasted they won't be able to find their ass with both hands. And when those two are passed out, we can do anything we want to Duncan. And then we just blame it on the Renicops. Mmm, you are a bad bitch. Oh, I bet everyone will think the guards did it. If we smear blood on them and use their guts. Oh, yes, and who could possibly blame us if we're too busy crying about it? <laughs> I'm in. We've got this. Let's go back in and don't you fret. Don't ever let them see you sweat. Oh. Wow. Oh. That was hot. Right? I love them. Oh. Um, and also, just acknowledging chat, I don't know how this even happened, but in the performance of Shakespeare, we have a hype train. Oh, I, I, hell yeah. I, I'm like, whoa. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Oh my goodness. There's even uh, more gift... Uh, Gifted subs, thank you, uh, Eric Jackson. Um, thank you also to Spring Hill Studios, Bark Branch, Effie Burton. Uh, thank you for all of your hype and bits. I am, uh, uh, I'm excited. Uh, I, I don't know if this has ever happened on a Shakespeare Twitch before. Well, I'm so glad. I think that that performance certainly deserved it. If I, it's like, hey, Darren Shoshana, come on out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Turn on your cameras. These brilliant people. Uh, we sat down and we like worked through this scene together um, to translate it. I absolutely like uh, cheated in my translations because I just worked with my actors and it was like how we went through the scene and decided how we wanted to act it out and like went through and translated it. And I just think it turned out so good. I, I don't know if I'd necessarily call that cheating. I think workshopping with your collaborative. actors. Collaborative. Yeah, it's very collaborative and it makes their performances honest. Yeah, they so the the thing that caught everyone off guard was that my translation of bring forth men children only was like, mm, you're so hot, right? And we turned it into you're a bad bitch, right? But like, <laughs> Because I, that's what I view it as. It's like, man, you're so hot. We should make kids right now. And they're only going to be sons because that's what matters. Um, so it, I just love this scene and they nailed it. What I love about the performance is also, I know which points of reference you're using. So obviously when Shoshana was talking about, uh, you know, I have a, you know, if I had a baby, if I had a kid, it's like, Oh, I know exactly what that scene is. Yeah. So many of these things like relate and relatable. 
which is very key to why we are doing Breaking Bar in the first place. Absolutely. It's all of those uh, moments that you can truly relate to that are present, you know, in the text and just getting a chance to say them in modern language can really remind us all. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, just looking at chat, like, I love how many of them, like, seem to feel the adaptation. So uh, good job on that, everyone. Excellent. All right. Are you ready for to present your next scene? I think so. Uh, so the next scene that I picked is Act 4, Scene 1, but just the cauldron spell, right? So it's a full spell uh, and a full scene, right? So the cool thing about the cauldron scene just generally, right, is that it is said to be where the curse of the Scottish play comes from because it is actual witchcraft. So the idea is that that is the like curse of the show or the luck of the show. So long as you respect it, it'll be fine. Um, and so it was very hype at the time because witchcraft was very hot in court, right? It was this sexy thing as it is. Um, I really wanted to do this show because as I mentioned earlier, I absolutely had played Witch 3 and so often the witches are all grouped together in kind of this amorphous, you know, just the weird sisters as a group. But they're such different characters when you look at what they bring to the table, like, or bring to the cauldron, literally, right? Because they just have such different vibes. And so getting to translate that was a joy. I want to give special call out here to Case because Case sat down and really worked these ingredients with me and was extraordinary in the translation. Um, I guess that's an early hype. I'll hype it again after we look at the original ingredients. So we're just doing the cauldron spell. Uh, we won't go into the full rest of the scene because I didn't want Hecate and I didn't want to deal with apparitions. So here All right. is act four, scene one, first monologue. Thrice the branded cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harp your Christ, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poison entrails throw. Toad, that under cold stone days and night has thirty-one. Sweltered venom sleeping got. Boil thou first in the charmed pot. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a fanny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt, toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's mummy, maw and gulf, of the raven, salt sea shark, root of hemlock dipped in the dark, liver of a blaspheming Jew, gall of goat and slips of yew, slivered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk and Tartar's lips, Finger of a birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, makes the gruel thick and slab. Add thereto a tiger's chaudron for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Cool it with the baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. Okay. Oh, oh, I love that one. So, so it's always a really beautiful moment to me in any like 
show to see how they're doing their witches and whether or not they're distinguished or I'll say it together. We did, of course, have to figure out how we were going to do the lines that the witches generally do say together because of the format we decided to not go with uh, all at once because I think we all learned that the first time we tried to sing people happy birthday on Zoom that that doesn't work so well. Mm -hmm. um, so we split it up. So as I said before, Case was invaluable and extraordinary in helping with the translation of this. Uh, this was the scene that we tried to keep the iambic pentameter. We kept the syllables um, to kind of give it that sing-song, witch, uh, spell work kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very pleased. Now, obviously, the spell work is full of scary ingredients. I probably should have mentioned that ahead of time, but I am gonna give some content warnings for our ingredients because they are not necessarily all of the ones you're expecting. Um, content warnings for our spell include poison, blackface, sexuality, wildfires, ice, child's death, and abortion. So if any of those things are too much, please pop back in in five minutes. Uh, because we really, I really tried to bring that same like gritty horror, but from a modern standpoint. Um, and so here we go. Here we go. My familiar has called thrice today. Three days at one. He has been trending. Bet. Give our spell starting power with a moon-dried nightshade flower, bloom lovingly hand-grown from seeds with intention sown. Deadly beauty now well spent, hung and dried in waxing crescent. Double, double, toil and trouble, tweets uncovered in scandal bubbles, screenshots of a Snapchat sext with timestamps and sources checked, deleted posts, his old MySpace, a long lost photo of college blackface, a private jet from his foundation's coffers with pictures of non-disclosure settlement offers. With this charm of righteous power, we bait the lure of the ivory tower. Double, double toil and trouble, eat the rich and keep them humble. Tooth of Branson, gland of musk, hair of Bezos, a charred hive husk, from the streets of paradise, chicken cutlets marked down twice. Lung of a perjured TV preacher, a red grading pen of a teacher whose district reimbursed the price. A family rosary pilfered by ice, pediatric bio waste from a clinic one state west makes our spell work stick the best. Add McConnell's beady eye. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. With our ritual at its end, all that's left is to hit send. Oh my God! I oh am my God! I'm so proud of how that turned out. What? What? Oh yeah. So what we ended up doing was trying to pick what the kind of underlying theme of each witch was, right, to do this. So what we did was give witch one a traditional but kind of like type A personality about like being a bit more traditional and kind of bringing to the fact that modernly witchcraft is, it's not a fantasy thing, right? This is a, this is a faith system, it's practice, it's a true thing that is, is present uh, for a lot of people and bringing in kind of that like feel in that lore with, you know, Anthea's like incredible witch look, right? Um, mm -hmm was kind of the, the thought with which one that it was a long thought out ingredient that had to take a lot of work and effort. 
And then which two traditionally does a lot of, you know, like, uh, I, you know, tiny body parts. It's frogs, body parts, lizards, legs, right? Howlets, wings, tiny little ingredients. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted was to keep the like moments of weakness or these tiny things that have great impact when you find them, right? So we went with the social media, like the little things that you can find. Um, and then which three we leaned into like a Gen Z feel of like just a brutal, uh, cause I mean, I, it's all like monster parts and like what's more of a monster equivalent today than a billionaire in this capitalist hellscape, right? So we just tried to kind of like lean in to that. Um, and Case was, like I said, so helpful in getting all of this together. I had like what I wanted and was like, so what are the actual words here? I was like, oh, I want three billionaire body parts and then a global warming reference in case like began to turn this into like real things, right? And I'm gonna give those ingredients to Ryan to post um, cause I'm incredibly pleased with how they turned out. I feel like at some point I have to go back or hopefully someone clipped it because that was um that was some next level Shakespeare. I don't know if you could say that, but it kind of was. It was very, very good. Uh, um I, I'm just so pleased with those beautiful and talented people. Yeah, to um answer a question in chat, um, will the script be posted on the Patreon? The answer is yes. I'm going to post it in the Patreon um, because this is, uh, pardon my Shakespeare, but fucking brilliant. <laughs> All right. Um, are we okay? Now that we've had our adrenaline and acknowledgement, <sighs> just like, whoa, okay. Are we ready for our next scene? I think we are. Um, so I'm going to. I know Ryan mentioned earlier that I'm not gonna do it just the way he did. And not only am I not keeping a through line of a theme the way that Ryan did for his brilliant Romeo and Juliet adaptation, um, but I also want to switch it up here and give you a modern translation before an original text. Um, this piece is one that I knew I really wanted to have done here. It is the tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow speech. And it, I feel, is so often not given in context, and very few people know that it comes from the Scottish play. Quite often, the first two lines of the piece are cut, um, which I think cuts all the context. Uh, so I have opinions, TM, about it. Uh, so I wanted to see it done, and I wanted to see it done by Derek. Um, and so when Derek and I worked this over, we were talking about how so often it's the language that keeps people from engaging in Shakespeare, but it doesn't have to be, right? Like the, the language isn't as scary as you think it is. It, you know, you could really get there. Um, and so what we wanted to do was give you, the audience, our interpretation, our modernization and translation before the original text so that you can see that you really do know what's being said by the time we get there. Um, I will also be making a small appearance with a line in this one. I will be taking Seton's lines, AKA line at the very beginning to start this off. Um, so this is again, act five, scene five, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow translated first, and then the original text. All right. Forgive me, sir. Your wife is dead. That wasn't the plan. She was supposed to die after me, to watch the credits roll over my corpse and then wait name after name after name 
sitting in the fucking dark for a post credit scene, waiting for the promise of something more, not knowing the projectionist is long gone. And you can scream out in the theater, leap from your seat and storm into the lobby. In your righteousness, demand satisfaction. Demand what you'll do, because you are the king. But you're just another Karen asking to see the manager. And you accomplish nothing. I just wanted to see Derek do that monologue and it's so good in modern and original. Um, so as you can see, we translated that one not directly across rather than taking tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow into a time reference. We made it about kind of a relatable thing that people experience where meaning stops happening, right? It's when you're watching those end credits and at a certain point you stop thinking about who the third sound tech was or the eighth person who did the animation. And I always try and stay and watch all those credits because each and every one of those people worked really freaking hard on that project. But we wanted to keep that kind of when it stops having meaning thought. Um, but before I get too far into it, I am going to give it back to Derek to give the original text um, because you'll find that it's almost easier to follow than ours and not because I think we made a convoluted version, but simply because the text doesn't have to get in your way. It's not the language that's stopping you. The queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And that is why the first thing that I thought of when I got a chance to direct the Scottish play was I sure hope Derek will do that monologue for me. I had to suppress myself from screaming. <sighs> I so just, good. Uh, because often when I do see renditions of that uh, passage, the way Derek just went signifying beat 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 nothing gave so much more weight to that uh, nothing rather than just saying all at once it's like oh my god oh oh yeah right so it was so incredible to me that like the chance to work over this scene the first time derek and i met to like talk about this monologue we didn't even like actually get to the text because we were so excited about talking about the general thought like we went through the text but we didn't like actually present it or say it we just talked about it mm -hmm. and just like the insight that derek had about it derek teaches not just shakespeare but shakespearean improv so the like depth of understanding that he has is extraordinary and getting the chance to go through it with him was so good and i'm so glad that everybody fell in love with that karen line because i loved that line uh i thought it because what is more of 
you know, uh, sounded fury. And fury idiot, signifying nothing you know? is a Karen. A Karen. Um, <laughs> oh so God. yeah, it it was such a joy to go through it. Um, I'm so impressed with how it turned out, and of course, Derek's performance is uh, stunning. Can we have Derek con- come on for a moment? Because I have to ask him a question because of something that you brought up, and I remember hearing this in tech rehearsal. First of all, uh, Derek, amazing, amazing performance. Thank you. Um, now, I want to know what Shakespeare improv is because I assume just from the name that's rather difficult to do because Shakespeare lines are pretty much set over 500 years ago. So what is Shakespeare improv? Uh, so Shakespeare and improv, and, and they've got and, and they do it in most major, you know, so if you, if you, uh, wherever you live, you can type it out, but some of the major steps. So Southern California, Bay area, Seattle, Chicago, New York. Um, uh, the whole key to Shakespeare and uh, improv is really just to focus on the actual emotion itself. Uh, what were the emotions they were trying to do? Um, the language is great, but it's not precious. Uh, it wasn't precious in Shakespeare's time. Uh, we know it wasn't precious because when Shakespeare wanted to describe an emotion and he couldn't find the word, he'd make it up. So <laughs> nothing, nothing says the language is not precious than the words that Shakespeare just made up because he couldn't find a word. And more importantly, he didn't really care it, if it fit and there was emotion behind it that defined the word. And so we have these great words in the English language now uh, that that emotional phrases and um, you know, anecdotes and whatnot, uh, simply because they captured the emotion best. So when we're improvising Shakespeare, we go through the tropes, we go through the archetypes that you would see, uh, we go through um, uh, how you break it down. Uh, so a mm-hmm. little bit of what you would expect, whether it be a comedy or a drama. Um, and then we just leap into character and explore the emotion. And uh, we do some of the language work and we, we try to pull it off the best we can. Uh, and if we don't, uh, uh hooray we just we just say uh we're just modern day shakespeare people Heck wow yeah. wow amazing thank you thank you, you bet. Uh, and yeah hedgy and chet is saying some of those real uh precious language lines right absolutely he just i mean shakespeare just it was it was mostly dick jokes right and yeah. so like i mean there was some incredible emotion behind those dick jokes but it it that understanding was one of the things that had Derek and I, after our first meeting, go, we should really switch this. Like, just just tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Give the give the translation first, right? Um, and I'm just so happy with the way that it that it turned out. Yeah, it's like saying, "I love you, Juliet." Hard, hard, <laughs> like my dick. Hard, <laughs> I so mean, that's, hard. That's it, right? <laughs> that's pretty but, much like, it. <laughs> And anytime something's important, say it three times, right? You don't know, like it's it's really one of those. So Oh, yeah. uh Hedgy Cleric just said my high school senior English teacher called Shakespeare the married with children of its day. And I don't think you're wrong. No, it was really for the masses. It was like supposed to be given to people when they were mostly drunk and like maybe in a bar fight. Like Right. And so that's why you got to say the important things a couple of times. So nobody misses it. So, <laughs> And a little Muppet show for sure. Oh, so. I like the comment. Julia, I showed you my dick. Please respond. <laughs> uh, you know, not wrong. Not wrong. All right. Um, I, I feel so we- sad. I feel sad that this is going to be the last scene we're going to be doing because this was all so good. Oh. But, you know, we're um, – but it's all about quality over quantity, and let's go ahead and handle this next scene. If you would like to uh, tell us about this scene and preface it for us. Okay. Uh, so this scene, Act 5, Scene 8, um, was, is one of the generally, like, the best fight scenes that you'll get in a show, right? Um, When we were going through it, Shoshana was actually telling me that she had taken a fabulous fight choreography class that because the scene is done as a fight so frequently that her incredible instructor had been like, okay, this is actually how it should be fought. And that he followed the fight through the punctuation. 
and that like the punctuation showed you where the sword blows should be and like what's going on. Um, so bringing it to Zoom was a little tough, right? Uh, because obviously we're not gonna have a sword fight. Um, but it was still really good to bring because after tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, um, Derek and I were talking about kind of where the show goes from there. Cause obviously that's a huge turning point for Lord M. And to me, like the Scottish play is just an extraordinarily tragic love story. And so when one half of the pair dies, right? You don't get any redemption arc. There's no grand moral. It's really just nothing for Lord M from there. So like, what does that then do to the rest of the play, right? Cause you're not done yet. Um, and I'll be real, I have an absolute soft spot for Macduff because of an extraordinary performance by a man named Michael Lutheran in the production that I did. He always made me feel it right here, but I really wanted to change Macduff to a lady, um, to lean into a different feel and have this great kind of combat and this great finish be between two, like a, a wronged mother and our villain. Uh, really important for those of you that don't know the Scottish play, earlier in the show, Lord M sends assassins to Macduff's castle and they kill his entire family. So all the babies and his wife. Um, and there's an insinuation that Macduff is like a good Scottish man who has a lot of babies. And so there's like a lot of ch child blood, right? Um, in the production I was in, I actually also played Macduff's son. Um, so it is always good to know the context behind it. And without any further ado, because I want to see this one done, I'm going to pass it over to Shoshana and Derek for Act 5, Scene 8. Why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? While I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Turn, hellhound, turn! Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword, thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. Thou losest labor, as easiest may's thou entrenchment air. With thy keen sword and press, as make me bleed, let fall thy blade on my vulnerable crest. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. Despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee Macduff was from her mother's womb untimely ripped. <clears throat> Accursed be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. And be these chuckling fiends no more believed that palter with us in a double sense that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight thee. Then yield thee, coward. Live to be the show and gaze at the time. We'll have thee, as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole and underwrit. Here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Burnham would do come to Dunsinay and thou oppose being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield, lay on Macduff, and damned be him that cries first, hold, 
enough. Yes. <sighs> no, uh, I mean, I just really like that scene. It's always a satisfying moment. I love the exchange between those characters. They're some of my favorites. They really are. Um, I won't go too far into the translation before we do it, but know that it was very difficult to figure out how to change the line from my mother's womb untimely ripped. Um, because Shoshana and I are both cesarean section babies and Shakespeare nerds. So we absolutely both use that phrase when people like ask about your birth situation, right? We both are like, oh, well, I was from my mother's womb untimely ripped. So the idea of finding a modern equivalent for that was very difficult to kind of figure out. So I hope you like where we went with it. Um, no spoilers, let's get to it. Why should I be the puppet and cut my own strings? Oh, it's much more fun to see them fall. Face me, monster! Face me! I look forward to killing you the least. But leave now. You have, no, you have nothing left. No more babies for me to take. Shut the fuck up and fight me, you! <laughs> You're falling short if you come after me. You'll be punching air, striking without blood. My role is already written. I cannot be killed by one of woman born. Then check your script and read it again, knowing that Macduff is a father born. I have two dads. Christ, I feel so dumb that I didn't think of it that myself. And now everything they told me is wrong. What it seems they said isn't necessarily what it is. It's like the screenwriter doesn't give a shit. Then I won't fight back. Then turn yourself in. Your trial would be a spectacle. It'll be all that airs on any station. A million clickbait articles of, you won't believe Macbeth's great scheme. No, I will not stand trial. I will not be a star in your reality TV. I'm not your desperate housewife of Dunsinane. Let's cue the music. Let's dance to the witch's tune. I will fight to the death, but no Macduff. Don't you dare stop until one of us is dead. Oh, it's so good. I just love it so much. The Desperate Housewife of Dunsinane. I would 100% <laughs> watch Desperate Housewives of Dunsinane. I love it. Um, we definitely considered having like the Lord of the Rings moment of like, I can be like, I can't be killed by man of woman born. Like I am no man, right? But mm. what I decided ultimately to go with was rather than pick a like scientific, like I am of test tube born or like something like that was to go with gender because there are many people who are pregnant and have babies and not all of them are women. And so getting to just updated that way seemed like, a, in my head, the, the most powerful choice there. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. But there was a really excellent, um, in talking about everything, about what happens after the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, my first question to Derek when he talked about how like it really means nothing after this point was like, well, how do you play this scene then? Because I've always seen it very powerful, right? And obviously, there is no need to take power away just because nothing is what's remaining, you know? Um, and seeing this and getting to kind of continue with a meta idea of like roles already written 
and you know it's this is already cast if you would um was just the the kind of theme and flavor we took from it and i'm so pleased with how it all turned out i'm so pleased with how all of it turned out all of these brilliant actors and writing people and just beautiful faces i'm just so pleased um let's have everyone turn their cameras back on and come into the zoom room these beautiful faces Ooh. yes so um so i guess like let's uh we're we're gonna open ourselves to q a and i encourage chat if you have any questions for our director or our actors we're gonna use this time to just ask them about the process about um uh, about how you approach the role, um, about how you approach the scene work, um, um, your interest in Shakespeare, uh, and and everything. So um, let's start off with. Um, so I have a question that I want everyone um, to answer. If you uh, by going through this process, did you did you get a new epiphany or revelation about Shakespeare, whether it's play or uh, or the studying of Shakespeare or even acting, um, what epiphany or new thing did you learn from this process? Um, this is going to sound weird, but I'm going to start off with Derek, who has been performing this for a while as a teacher. Uh, did you learn anything new about this process? Um, the, the the interesting thing about the process is the, the process itself isn't um, uh, isn't incredibly new. Um, it's, uh, for example, like the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, mm -hmm. when, when they're first doing Shakespeare, they actually have the actors put, uh, they put uh, the text in their own words. So they learn the emotion first, which is kind of what we were doing. Um, I think what always surprises me about Shakespeare is that the <laughs> immense attention to detail when it, when it comes down to tying everything together. Um, <laughs> for example, so in our last scene, for example, um, in the original text, there's this there's this great line about. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, he talks about oh, be these juggling fiends no more believed. Okay, so it's it's a line that's in there. It's kind of buried, but be these juggling fiends is it's his last insult to the witches. Um, it's basically saying uh, all the witches do is they they take and they give away. You know, they they give and they take away. Um, and it's amazing that you can do the whole performance and miss some of those kind of callbacks. And then when you deep dive, you rediscover them. So that's one of my favorite things about Shakespeare is his just attention to call everything back and tie things together in a couplet. Nice. We'll go ahead around the circle. Next, um, Anthea, was there anything new that you learned about this process, this play, or Shakespeare in general? Um, for one thing, I learned that I suck at writing. Um, Ooh, incorrect. <laughs> oh! Pay the um, jar, pay the jar. <laughs> I'm very pretty tonight. Um, we believe uh, that. Yes, yes, you are pretty. You're very, very pretty. No, Ashley did a really good job. We um, bantered specifically about which one back and forth about like what was important to lean on. Was it more important to lean on the, ten the intention that which one sets for the spell? Or was it more important to lean on the ingredient itself? Um, and that was, it was very interesting to discuss like in depth what this witch was. And um, I think Rachel might've pointed it out in Tech Run that we often see the witches run as like one homogenous unit. Um, and Ashley really dragged that apart and tore it apart. So it was really, really fascinating to see that breakdown. Um, I really enjoyed figuring it out. I think we found a really good balance between uh, juggling which one's ingredient, which was a venomous toad, like a specifically very, 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 very venomous toad that she left under a rock for 30 days um, and uh, balancing her intention on how this spell gets started because it sort of sets the framework for the rest of the witches. Um, and I thought that that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. 
also writing Shakespeare is very hard. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. That was that was real hard. Um, mad props to Case. Mad props. <laughs> I mean, this is probably the first time. Um, I don't see a lot of Macbeth, but when I do, the witches do look homogenous. Like I, they they're often so dressed alike that they're all triplets, and therefore there's not supposed to be a barrier among them or or and here you didn't do that and my brain went whoa okay i have never seen the witches in this way before and that is a new thing um i have learned that they are different absolutely that was kind of what i wanted to get taken away from it and it's easier to do when you just do little scenes versus when you're doing the whole show Right. Mm -hmm. I know Case had a thought there. I was going to say, uh, it was something I think all of us in that scene tried to really, uh, one, in dissecting the language of the of the, the play itself, but also in updating it for this uh, for this work in um, figuring out what aspects and archetypes of modern witchcraft uh, each one represents and how we can uh, call to those because the uh, modern practitioners are, are so varied and uh, there's so many uh, generations even of practitioners active all at once and so we wanted to kind of bring that intergenerational feel which is also kind of a hearkening to I think the the triad that is the the witches in general. I've always viewed them as a stand-in, like archetypical for the mother maiden crone, um, and so getting that sort of same generational feel, but in a modern context, was also something I know we all tried to work on to bring into this. Um. See, sorry, I was like uh, typing to respond to something, but um, Shoshana, um, anything that you learned about, anything you knew that you learned about this process? Yeah, definitely. Um, I That's so amazing that you said that, Derek, about that's how they do it uh, in RSC, because based on this, I'm like using this technique now in the show I'm in, and it's been so incredibly helpful. It let me discover emotions that I hadn't realized were there before. Um, yeah, it was just, I've, I mean, I, I'm a big Shakespeare fan. I love getting like really into it, but I don't think I've ever gotten as into it um, as I have when, when I was working with Ashley and everybody on, on the translation. It was, it was, that's how I'm doing it from now on. Like it was, it was fantastic. Darren, um... Anything that you learned about this process, this play? I mean, you've been in my play as well. So you got to see, uh, be part of both of these. Um, any insight? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so this is my third time playing the character. And one thing that I have uh, never experienced, especially in this scene that I got from Ashley and later was mirrored with the chemistry with Shoshana, um, is to be in love with my wife. And I feel like in this scene, I never really focused on that. I was always more focused on my problems and not really thinking about this as a person who we're a team, we're really a ride or die, especially at the beginning um, and so uh, of the show, things drift, but at this part, we are really tight. So it was really great to feel that and to be able to, um, to work that into my lines. So I'm just not, as angry or upset or warrior, um, which is usually what I've carried in the past. So that was a great gift and I really enjoyed uh, the take and energy for it. And I would... This is probably the first time I've seen the interpretation where uh, you definitely see Lord and Lady Macbeth really as partners because often it's written that either uh, it's often written from the point of Lady Macbeth. Do you make her stronger? Do you make her not as strong as Macbeth? And that's kind of like what your gauge is. This is the first time where they're actually equal. And it's kind of way different and really, really cool because was not expecting that. It's an and, us. 
Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of a, a make or break for me when I'm watching a production of the Scottish play, that scene when they first interact or how they greet each other after and sex me here is really my like, okay, am I gonna like this? Or am I gonna like kind of like, like hold my breath through all of the Lady M and Lord M scenes because they're just making her a bitch instead of like a bad bitch. So mm -hmm. I loved the way that Shoshana played this one and the chemistry between you two was everything I wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, I have that same thing with Romeo and Juliet, where if Romeo is playing like he's 30 and important, it's like, I cannot watch this. <laughs> I can't watch this. He's a teenager. He's a horny teenager. Stop playing like he's important because he and knows things. He does not know things at all. Juliet knows things. He doesn't. <laughs> he only knows everything the way that any teenage boy does. Yeah, he knows everything. Sure um let's see rachel um any thoughts or insight or anything that you learned about doing this process oh my gosh i i like really have been thinking i was like oh i hope i go first so i can but honestly i learned that i like shakespeare more than i thought i did so i uh yeah i i love performing and i love um art but i was always kind of like shakespeare yeah I'll, I do it with my friends, um, but it's been really fun. Like even just yesterday, I like mentioned offhand that like um, that the Romeo plus Juliet uh, with Claire Danes and Leo was trending and then everybody had this like beautiful discussion about it. And I was like, wow, like something to revisit here. So I, I yeah, I learned that I like it more than I thought I did. Um, I have a question for you, Rachel, and you feel free to like, say, you know, I don't feel comfortable asking that question um, if, if that is where you want to go. Um, me, being a person of color, sometimes I feel like um, in the past that because Shakespeare is British and white, um, there's a level of it that was not accessible to me as a person. Um, but doing this because I thought this was fun made me realize that it is quite accessible. Um, because it's really about human relationships. Um, for you, um, as a person of color, did you have that same feeling in regards to Shakespeare at any point in your life? Yeah, yeah. I, well, and I think that way about anything that's pre, like, what, three, four years ago? Like, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, roles for people of color, roles for queer people, roles mm -hmm. for, like, that aren't kind of, like, written you know written by us with us all these things like I, I have a, a friend who's a playwright right now and and I was talking to her yesterday and she said you know really there is a conversation now about really wanting to put up plays that are not by white men um mm -hmm. and I was kind of always like why are we always do why are we always doing this why aren't we I know so many people who can write about so many other diverse experiences and all sorts of things so I think that I moved away from traditional theater in general after high school. I felt like I was always mm -hmm. auditioning for roles and I would always come up second, right? Like I would always come up second in high school. Like it, like the, the director would be like, oh, like, you know, you were so close to being Juliet. Like, you know, you could, you know, try and do this again or, you know, whatever it may be. And I always kind of like carried a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about it, I think. And I kind of went into art that was like, like I, I found the punk movement and I found, um, and I found burlesque and like, if I want to be Juliet and do burlesque and be Juliet every single night I get to, and I don't have to be at the mercy of casting directors or other people or things. And, um, and I'm so, so happy to see that that has changed in the last, you know, 10, 20, 30. Like, I, I really think there is, there is a lot of that opening up right now that I'm seeing and, and just watching shows, um, you know, black, black women sketch show and, and kind of all of these things that, that just didn't exist or, or just people with like normal bodies. Like you look at, you look at friends and I go, oh my God, like, no wonder I thought I couldn't be an actress. Like, no wonder I thought that I wasn't gonna cut it in this business. And I had to do something else, you know, because there just weren't normal looking people. And now on TV, I'm seeing more and more normal looking people. And I love that. And I think it, I'm just excited to see so many more stories from different people's perspectives. So yeah, I think not to complete, but yeah, I think I was like, why, <laughs> like, why, why are we like putting, like putting up so many plays of this old white man? Like why? 
Um, but I do, I did learn that I liked it more and more um, hearing people talk about it and, and seeing kind of some of the beautiful interactions and ideas that people have had about it. And I think there's reasons that it endures, but I do think that we should um, put up other work. Yeah. Thank you for answering that question. I just gave it to you on the spot, but I, um, I kind of thought it was important. It's a question that I've been dealing with um, surprisingly ever since I started this project. Um, like, am I the right person to do this? And I have to remind myself, yes, because I'm a person. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what I have to go, because I'm a person. That's a great way to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, Case, uh, I'm curious if you have learned anything from this process, because first of all, you gave an amazing translation of ingredients, something that is so thrown away, like the ingredients, but not. Uh, I mean, in the process of like translating those ingredients, I feel like I gained like a deeper appreciation and deeper understanding of the specific use of words that uh, that kind of were used in how we see uh, these characters, uh, because we obviously have don't know what the, this show was like to see it we only have the words and so through like looking at the words and using those to break down the differences between the three witches in particular um it gave me more of an insight into uh word choice and th the theme uh within it uh did you know yeah. you were so dope at iambic pentameter Oh, I'd love I am a pentameter before this. Uh, I just cool. uh, I just no don't skill. get a lot of a lot of chance to like throw that out there. Anytime you want to throw iambic pentameter out there, like I volunteer. That was wow. it's so good to get to work on that with you. Um, we have a question for the cast from Hedgy Cleric. Uh, what is your dream Shakespeare role? Um. I'll go ahead and answer this first because I, I know what my answer is automatically. My dream Shakespeare role is Peter Quince from Midsummer Night's Dream um, for a couple of reasons. Um, That's just you. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just me. Um, number one, it's because like whenever I had played Midsummer Night's Dream and I'm asked to play uh, Peter Quince, just for whatever reason, I nail that that part so hard that casting goes, I wish you were actually performing in this because it would be you. The other thing is it always is in my head that Shakespeare is most represented by Peter Quince. So with Shakespeare wrote a, uh, I believe Shakespeare actually wrote that role for himself. And so it's the most like Shakespeare. And we also forget Shakespeare also directed Shakespeare directed, and when I look at Peter Quinn, it's like, yeah, that's me. Yeah, very precise. Yeah, uh, very picky about his casting. It has to be said this way. No, not Minnie's tomb, you idiot. Lovingly. It's like, yeah, and it's to the point where I am adapting Midsummer Night's Dream right now, and it's one of the few roles that I am going to play myself. And I'm going to actually play that role in the adaptation because uh, – I'm very much that character. Um, Ashley, um, your dream Shakespeare role? Uh, it's a tricky question. Um, I kind of have like a one, two. Like okay. it's a, it's a like, I, it's hard to pick between the two. The default answer is Robin Goodfellow. I would give my many body parts, my left big toe to play Robin Goodfellow in like an excellent, rendition of Midsummer. Um, I hope in my life to play in Midsummer several times uh, in any role. I flip and love that show. Um, so you're telling and, me you want to be in Midsummer? Uh, I'll audition for you like, whoa, for sure. I'm okay. glad to be there. It's, okay. one of my it's one of my favorite roles. Um, the, the closing soliloquy of Puck is what was one of my go-tos for a long time. Um, and then I my other one that I would kind of put out there is uh, Beatrice, because well, who doesn't want to play Beatrice? Oh, it's been so much good. ado. So 
if you have a good like to play against like that's that's the money if you have your your benedict so uh that's that's my answers all right derek your dream shakespeare role um prospero from the tempest oh simply because he is actually uh, one of Shakespeare's more sympathetic characters. Like he's really been wronged, but he makes it so difficult to be liked. He is just so wrapped up in himself. And uh, it, it's, it's always been a joy to see like the first half of the play, Miranda could not be more bored by her dad. Um, and then when he gets over himself, then she's riveted. Um, uh, so that one would be from a uh, just a pure challenge. That's my that's next on my list. Oh, tell me when you do it. I know. Same. <laughs> Unless you want to direct it. <laughs> oh, I do that, too. Oh, OK. We may talk later. Next. Um, and Thea. Um, so I like actually have two things. Um, the first mm -hmm. one that's like always been like kind of a dream thing for me is uh, specifically Hamlet. And I was talking about this pre-stream um, Hamlet's uh, to be or not to be soliloquy is one of, to me personally, the most poignant pieces of Shakespearean writing. Um, I've suffered from depression for most of my life. And so like every time I've read that it's hit really hard and really close to home. Um, and it hits way, way, way different um, after being a server during a pandemic and working with the public and how much that left me feeling at the end of everything um, and how exhausted I felt. And just being this person who is super nihilistic and also trying to be super cheerful and hating everything. Um, and so like it was, it's always been a really, really poignant scene to me. It's always been something that's been very personal and fun fact I know almost the entire soliloquy by heart already um I've got problems um the other one that I've always really wanted to do was um wall from Midsummer Night's Dream huh? um <laughs> just specifically wall <laughs> that's it just wall <laughs> just <laughs> duly noted um I have a very vivid memory from when I used to do run fairs as a child um, at Black Point. They did that part of Midsummer Night's Dream, and there was a person who played the played Wall, and their performance of it always stuck just so vivid in my head. Like I remember every facial expression, every tonal shift during it. Um, so Wall is my other choice there <laughs> shoshana dream roll that's uh sorry i just that's so awesome <laughs> and they, that's great <laughs> I, I think wall is amazing too um uh so i one of the things that i've really i'm really excited about getting older is that there, now that there's all these shakespeare roles that i am old enough to play and someone that i've always wanted to play is olivia um from twelfth night uh i just think i think that she is more funny than people give her credit for like i think that she's really sort of like an anti mame sort of character and like is a little like like i think there's just so much fun stuff you could do with her and she's normally played as like this very proper woman or like just yeah she's she's like you could get so silly with her and i would love to do just like a really fun production uh and twelfth night is is great it's midsummer is my favorite comedy but twelfth night is like right up there second place <laughs> i agree that i hate when they play her boring i want that like full cougar like she better be like really yes, pursuing she's it so, and... like mm, yeah. hey viola <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> Like, there's a reason she's been single for this long. Come on. <laughs> Darren, favorite uh, dream Shakespeare role? Uh, so I am 
uh, in Derek's camp, and like usually he's a step ahead of me. Um, but I uh, I also have always wanted to play uh, Prospero in the Tempest. Uh, it's someone that I've always wanted. Um, I I did like when I was a kid play Prospero, but I was I think. 17 and i don't think it really counts although i did do a lot of the original text with very little editing and absolutely loved uh getting into the character as well um but you know 17 isn't really the best time to play shakespeare's farewell role um so i would love to play trinculo who's another character in that play uh kind of the jestery kind of uh, uh jokester kind of character body character um i enjoy those kind of um humorous roles as well so i would be totally down to do that and i have always wanted to be in uh henry v. and at some point i would love to be in that show uh almost in any role as long as i can be in some of the big pieces um yeah especially the saint christmas i've always wanted to be on stage in that scene and giving the speech is great um but being there would be really awesome to do a special moment rachel uh dream shakespeare role I mean, someone cast me as Juliet so I can heal my inner child and can move forward. (laughs) (laughs) I still look really young. You do. (laughs) It's still doable. There are productions, or you can make one. (laughs) Let's see. Uh, Case. I I would watch that. 100% Rachel. Uh, I think if I, uh, I think the the dream role I would love to play would be um, uh, Rosalind in As You Like It. Uh, mm. Rosalind Ganymede. Uh, because of the like themes of like queer theory that are present in that, the notions of gender and identity and uh, kind of the Im- gender ambiguity and like gender euphoria in the freedom that comes from like finding like uh, your voice in your presentation in some ways and uh, the way Rosalind uh, has a, a stronger voice sometimes as Ganymede than as Rosalind um, and as like a trans non-binary person like it carries a lot of like different weight in the uh, in the ideas presented within uh, that kind of uh, space. All right. So I believe we're at the end of our show, but before we go, um, where can people find you on the internet and what are you up to? What would you like to promote? Um, I'm going to start off with our director, Ashley. Hey, uh, I'm not really an internet person. Um, in fact, the witches all made fun of me because I was like, what do the kids do these days? Like trying to come up with lines for stuff. Uh, but you can generally find me at a LARP because I love them. Uh, so if you're looking to find more Ashley content, uh, come and play Refuge or Dystopia Rising, NorCal. Um, and uh, please listen to all of these beautiful people as they give you where you can actually find them. All right. Uh, Derek, where can we find you um, on the internet or what products are you up to? Ooh, let's see. Uh, 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 you can find me at uh, unscripted.com. Uh, that is uh, unscripted theater in the Bay Area. Our season will open up in the fall. You can also find me at Stageworks, uh, which is uh, also in San Francisco in the Mission. I've got uh, various products uh, or teams that I coach uh, perform at Stageworks Theater. So either one of those two. Nice. And Thea, where can people find you on the internet? And what are you up to? Um, so I don't like Ashley. I don't actually have a huge internet presence. Um, you can't find me on Facebook. I like friends. Um, but what I am up to is I am the director for Refuge San Francisco, which is a new-ish LARP um, in the Bay Area. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's your traditional sort of high fantasy LARP. Um, and on top of that, I am starting up an organization with a wonderful uh, bar of people called Bar, which is Bay Area Role Playing. We are a nonprofit that is getting started to help um, LARPs be able to run in the Northern California area. So we'll hopefully be able to do a lot with that. Um, you can find me there. You can find my LARP at refuge. Same, I think it's refugesf.org. 
org um, or refugelarp.com. All right, Shoshana, what are you up to? You better plug the thing. I, I'm going <laughs> to plug the thing. Uh, so normally you can find me Monday nights on uh, Total Party Kills, the game Total Party Kills on um, uh, Twitch channel Scabby Rooster, but I with, haven't with been With me. There. <laughs> Usually yes, I'm there too. I am. Yeah. Um, but I haven't been there in a while because I've been in rehearsals for Titus Andronicus. I'm playing Tamara, which actually like has, that's my dream role, but I didn't think I could say it because I'm already playing it. Like I'm living the dream, everybody. It's happening. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. I've wanted to play Tamara since I was like, since I first read Titus and I was like, She's a bad bitch. I want to be talking about bad bitches. She's like the ultimate one. Um, and the production is really incredible. It's an amazingly diverse cast. Um, and for those of you who know the show, there's a lot of sort of like racially charged stuff that happens in it. Um, and we really weren't afla afraid to explore that and um, present it in a way that is just it's really good like i'm just really proud to be a part of it and all the actors in it are just incredible um there's gonna be a lot of blood uh but it's so there's a streaming uh the 23rd and 24th are streaming shows and then the next weekend if you're in los angeles um and feel safe enough to come inside they will require a vaccination proof and I think you have to wear masks now because of the new thing um but uh it's in-person shows live theater everybody live theater I'm so excited I can't wait uh I definitely play. have my virtual ticket oh, I can't thank you. Thank yes you. oh where um I know you mentioned the role but where can they find like that performance oh uh so it's boomstick theater uh is it can I'll put I'll put the thing in yes. the chat that yeah or or let me see if I can do it. Like um, T H E A T R E or E R. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> the atre or uh, theater? Yeah. E R E R E R. E R. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Boomstick, as in like Army of Darkness. This is my Boomstick. Boomsticktheater.com. Okay, I just put up the link. Ah, oh, thank you. You're okay. welcome. We yeah, want to support it, you. Yeah. I'm super excited knowing that like, especially for the virtual shows, because like, it's going to be real weird doing it with no audience. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Uh, Darren, where can people find you on the internet or what you were up to? Hey, I also don't have a big uh, internet power presence, but I LARP with these wonderful people, yourself included. And uh, definitely love Dystopia Rising. It's a great way for me to tell a story and get out in the world, which is something I really enjoy. Um, I am going to be in a movie coming out. It's in post-prediction right now. Uh, it's called The Knicks. It's directed by Anthony Ferrante, the guy who did Sharknado. Yay! Uh, he's a fantastic guy. And it's coming out. It, again, it's, it's I don't know when exactly it's going to be released, but very soon. So hopefully by the end of the year. I'm really excited about it. Hell yeah. Rachel, where can people find you on the internet and what are you up to? Um, I'm on the internet, I'm mostly on Twitter at Pinteresting, P-I-N-T-O-R-E-S-T-I-N-G. Um, and I am in New York City getting people vaccinated. So I spend all my time doing that. Uh, talk to your friends and loved ones. Um, if people are unsure, uh, reach out to me if you are in New York and want a friend uh, or if you uh, don't know what to say to your friends and loved ones who are nervous about getting the vaccine because uh, we can talk about it. Um, and super happy to be be here and and doing this. It's a, a really fun change of pace. So thanks so much. Thank you. Case, where can people find you on the internet and what are you up to? Uh, well, they can find me like immediately uh, on Wednesday here again, where I will be uh, playing a game that I have known nothing about, but uh, play testing. It'll be super fun uh, playing in human conditions with the uh, uh, creator of it and, and Ryan and some other wonderful people. Uh, but you can also find me on uh, Twitter as well at a poisel. Um, you can find me on Instagram case.poisel and uh, largely I, you can also find some of my writing on Patreon at patreon.com slash poisel where I write about games. I write games. I talk about games a lot. Uh, you can find my work in kids on bikes, uh, strange adventures, volume two um and some other things i'm working on right now so 
All right. So, um, uh, I am your host, Ryan Omega. Uh, you could find me on Wednesday, uh, and we will be play um live play testing um a game called Inhuman Conditions. It itself has already like won some awards for being an interesting game. Uh, but um, I'm going. I work. Ah, sorry. I am going to be working with Tommy Rungis, who uh, designed this game because he is trying to do an online variant of this game, which is normally played in person, and we are an actual playtest for this game. In fact, he developed some new rules that I kind of went over, and I suggested changing a couple of things, so he made those changes. So it's actually cool to kind of work with this guy. I'll show the promo um, right here. Um, now... Tommy Morenges is probably most known for being the game designer of Secret Hitler. Um, but he's also made a few other games. That's just his most famous one. He apologizes for the Jumanji effect of what it has done in the past four, uh, four years. That's, that's his disclaimer. He's sticking to it. Um, but if you don't know anything about Inhuman Conditions, it is a game that is based off of the interrogation scene from Blade Runner. So you're trying to figure out if the person in front of you is a robot. Hmm. And it's a really interesting game. Um, the players include uh, some regular cast members, uh, including Bria Nicole, Blythe Kala, and Renee Ritchie. And, of course, uh, Keith Poizel will be joining us on Wednesday. Uh, later this week, I believe it's later this week, uh, I will also be working on the open audition for Much Ado About Nothing, which is going to be directed by, um, um, by Max, Max Colburn, um, and who's a real life dramaturg. And, um, if you are interested in auditions, the auditions are open, so feel free to contact me for an audition slot. We know that the auditions will be taking place Friday um, between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. Pacific. And right now, all the rules are open. Um, the director will decide. I'm not directing it, um, but he is. Um, but I am there to help support the casting process. Um, the actual performance is going to be on August 9th. Um, and I am also still in the middle of casting Midsummer. I haven't made any decisions yet because I am still um, adapting it. Because as like if you already know that adapting like the scenes tonight take a while, uh, I am still adapting Midsummer even though I announced I was doing it a month ago because it takes that long. Um, because there's a lot. Uh, the scenes in Midsummer are longer than you think. That's why it's taking a while. <laughs> and there is a lot of that. Is some. Dialogue on dialogue on dialogue. Yep, I just finished adapting one scene three weeks later. <laughs> just one of them. <laughs> Is so, it spoilers if you tell us what scenes you're doing? Uh, no, it's not spoilers. So, um, let's see. I I have them. I have them written. Uh, my apologies for like trying to get that out right now, but let's nah. see. Uh. Nah. No worries if you don't want to, but I'm like, is someone a spaniel? Like, are, are how many fairies are you doing? Like, what's going on? You know. So, so the thing about Midsummer is that you have a lot of um, smaller parts, like peas blossom, cobweb that say hail, 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 and I'm like, but I want you to say more than that because you're part of a troop. So each of those characters are going to have uh, personalities. Um, you know, As someone who played Mustard Seed, I deeply appreciate that. Yes. So, like, you know, so they just have little elements to them. So, so, um, so the scenes I'm covering are Act 3, Scene 1, where um, Bottom gets transformed. Um, then we are going to do Act 5, Scene 1, so that really, really long um, scene where the performance happens among the mechanicals. Um... Also, like a couple of other scenes, um, Act Two, Scene One, where they, uh, where the um, couples end up in the forest, and in my adaptation, they're in Vegas, so they're in, they're coming from LA, they're planning to be in Vegas to elope, because that's what you do. That's what you do. Because that's what you do. <laughs> um, and then I have one other scene that's not immediately coming up because I haven't highlighted it. So, 
Um, so they're not coming from the beginning, weirdly enough, because I love um, Act 1, Scene 2, where the um, players get together. But it's also one of the few acts in Shakespeare that you don't have to translate very much. You know exactly what is happening. It's like, there's nothing to change. So I decided to go with something that was a little bit more challenging. Also, heck yeah, paper mache donkey heads, hedgy. Heck yes. In the chat. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Let's see if I could find um, someone we can someone we can raid um, a little bit. Like, let's see who's... Uh, oh, duh. Do you know who's on? It would probably be the Scabby Rooster. Let's raid our friends. It's sort of like, who should we raid? Oh, the show that we're normally on. So let us let me go ahead and do the raid. Scabby Rooster. The Scabby Rooster. And we probably should say something Shakespearean. Uh, what's our what's our call going to be? Um. Well. Hell is, hell is don't fuck up and you won't be a fuck up. Don't fuck up. <laughs> I probably, I probably hell, is, hell is empty because what, Derek? Hell is empty because the devils are here. Mm. I am so far steeped in blood that to turn back now would be as tedious as going or. <laughs> that, that's a, a little mouthful. Just a casual. I want to do something about the Karens. Ooh. Karen about the Karen signifying nothing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hmm. Mm, we might be thinking too I, hard about this. I think the I think the line we did was you think you're king shit, but you're just a Karen asking for the manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part uh, of me thinks hashtag justice for Duncan. <laughs> that one's I good. Like that. The other one is just out out damn spot. Mm, it's absolutely true. A damned spot of Shakespeare coming to raid. All right, let's do that. Out out damn damned spot. Okay, we're gonna press a raid now. And thank Woo! you so much. Bye.